And welcome on into the latest edition of the Blue Horseshoe Podcast. He is George Bremer. I am Ryan Hickey. We are sitting here coming to you live. Well, not really live, I guess, but coming to you anyway here on a Tuesday morning, George. Hours after potentially hearing the worst case scenario and hearing the worst news possible for this 2023 season. And that is that it feels at this point almost inevitable. Anthony Richardson's rookie year is over. Now, according to ESPN, Jim Mersey has told uh, the worldwide leader, quote, the most likelihood is that he, Anthony Richardson, probably going to be uh, gone for the year. I mean, it's not definite, but he probably misses this year and we're going to have to contend with that factor. And quote, first, obviously on the record comments from anyone within the Colts about any sort of timeline or possibility there, George. Now, you hear Jim say probably does not guarantee that surgery is an option, but I'll, I'll ask you this. I don't think Jim Mersey is telling ESPN, the athletic amongst a few other outlets on Monday night that Anthony Richardson probably is going to get surgery and most likely is out for the year. If it wasn't a 95, maybe even 99% chance, this is going to happen, right? Like, even though he's not saying definitely George, would you be still at this point surprised if we're talking about anything but surgery for Anthony Richardson on his right shoulder? Yeah, I mean, it, that was already the direction this seemed to be headed. And the fact that Shane Steichen was not ruling it out was already, you know, raising a lot of red flags. So then you have the owner come out and say, yeah, this is this is most likely what's going to happen. Um, at that point, it'd be pretty stunning if you see a different outcome. Um, and, you know, from all accounts, and uh, again, we don't have a medical degree, so <laughs> – you know, we haven't looked at these x-rays. And even if I did, I wouldn't know what I was looking at. Uh, but when you listen to the experts, they all are saying this is what is best. And and again, it's it's an injury with a high risk of recurrence. Um, I, I just don't think you want to go back down that road. You know, bring him out here four weeks from now or, or eight weeks from now and have it happen again. That's even worse, I think, than just saying, you know what, get surgery, shut it down. Absolutely. It's, it's terrible scenario. I mean, it, everything is from, from the moment he was laying there, you know, with his arm hanging by his side on the field against the Titans, there was no good outcome. And from that moment on, it, it, there were only bad choices available. And I think, you know, the, the thing that, that probably everybody's going to focus on the most that, that hurts the most is the experience factor. I mean, coming in that that's what he was lacking. You only get four starts that's a pretty bad, it's not worst case scenario because none would have been worse, but it's the lower quartile of the lower quartile here. Uh, and so I think you've got to, but you, you got to deal with it now. And I think that's, you know, you can't go back and, and change the past. So now it's, it's about getting him fully healthy, uh, having him as involved as he can be in, in game planning. And, you know, we saw him uh, clearly on the head, headsets you know he he was plugged in on the sideline on Sunday and he's going to have to be throughout the rest of the year and you just hope that you know he can pick up some things visually and and just from being around the team that will help him next year when he is you know as as we said when this happened the next time you see him he needs to be 100% healthy this surgery at least pretty much guarantees that Right. And like I said, it's frustrating. It's obviously the worst case scenario when you're talking about now missing the rest of the season and having the 2023 season before it started be really for the most part, primarily about Anthony Richardson's development. And now we're going to see basically that come to an end sooner than we ever thought or wished or wanted and have him just finish one game out of probably 17 is like I said, not exactly what uh, we were hoping for or expecting in terms of development here in his rookie year. But like you said, George, at the end of the day, at this point with the injury happening, the best thing the Colts can do now is not compound it. And like I said, rush back and still try to salvage the 2023 season at the risk and maybe at the peril of Anthony Richardson hurting that shoulder again, or another part of his body because he's overcompensating for that and leaving himself uh, susceptible and exposed to getting hit and dinged up elsewhere. And again, it's frustrating. It's disappointing, but at least on the surface, two things. One, it seems like the Colts are prioritizing the long-term health and Anthony Richardson doing the same thing as well, which obviously, like I said, is the number one factor here. 2023 is about development, but we're hoping by 2032, 
this is a guy with, you know, a Super Bowl ring on his finger and still the franchise quarterback. Well, doing what's best for Anthony Richardson in 2032 may mean shutting down him in 2023. And also seems like everyone's on the same page, which is also good communication. There's there's not reports of Anthony Richardson, again, on the surface, wanting one thing, the Colts wanting the other, vice versa. I It sucks. It's a hard lesson to learn, but it does seem like going back to Andrew Luck, the Colts did learn the lesson. They are taking that lesson with them uh, when it comes to treating Richardson and are not, again, are not fighting or are not having miscommunications. It seems like everyone's on the same page, which again, now that the injury happened, it's how can you make the most of it? Those are two areas where I do think right now, at least to the Colts credit on the surface, they seem to be trying to now accept reality, make the most of this crappy situation. Again, to make sure that their future is still as intact as it possibly could be. Yeah, not forcing them out there at 75% or whatever and and trying to manage this and, and all the maintenance that we saw going on with Luck, you know, not practicing every day of the week. And uh, you just don't want to go down that road. I mean, he's 21. That's that's the, the bottom line. You know, we talk about missing experience and everything else. He's 21. You're going to have a 22-year-old quarterback next year uh, who's still extremely young, still has a long road ahead of him. Get him healthy and – you know, move forward because what we did see was encouraging. And I think that's honestly makes this even more frustrating. The fact that the flashes that you did get were, were highly encouraging. I think he was ahead of, of where a lot of people thought he would be uh, in a lot of areas, whether it's accuracy, which I think he was better on than, than advertised, whether it was, you know, pocket awareness. I think we saw that early on. Uh, you could see that on his film in Florida, that that was going to be something that, that he was advancing. And he obviously was, but it the poise that came with that, you know, in the big situations, it never felt like he was in over his head. You know, I don't think there was any point this year where where you watched him and thought, mm, this moment's too big for him or he's not ready for this. And that, you know, for a 21-year-old who came in with 13 college starts, that was a major question mark. And, and it's gone. I don't think you have to worry about that. There's a lot of other questions about whether or not he can stay healthy and what they can do to kind of, you know, further that. Uh, but I think on the field, though it was far too small a sample size and, and far less than people want to see, I think he not only checked every box, I think he exceeded a lot of expectations with what he did in, in the in a little bit of time that we were able to see him. I want to get to, because you said playing style, I want to get to a quote Shane Sykes said last week about that here in a second. But I think, like I said, it's frustrating because there's positives and negatives to his rookie year. So let me ask you this, assuming, again, I don't think Jim Mercer is saying what he's saying about probably uh, Richardson getting surgery in a season being over if that was not 99% the case here. So let's just say that that happens and Richardson's season is done for the year, George. With a guy that, like I said, showed flashes and at times was more developed and I think more airs than maybe we expected at the NFL level compared to offseason and by the time the coach drafted him, you have right one game where he started and finished. He's going to miss 16 games and either completely miss him or not be able to finish the game. In that short time, though, it did show flashes and pop and sizzle. How would you overall describe Richardson's rookie year if, in fact, this is the last of it already? Frustrating, you know, because of because of all those things you just said. I think the fact that you were you did get such a, a taste of the promise and the potential that's there. Uh, and then to have him play less than a quarter of the season, uh, you know, is it, it's frustrating. I, I can't think really any other word. I, I think that's what the team's going to be looking at it too. Uh, but at the end of the day, I don't know that I don't know. There's a lot of fault to go around here, um, and we'll get to that here in a little bit in terms of playing style and things like that. But we talked about it, you know, while while these injuries were happening, it wasn't like he was playing a reckless style. You know, he, he was just playing football, and unfortunately, he he had situations come up uh, that did not end well for him. And you've got to look into that, and I'm sure they will, in every element of it, and, and try to figure out, okay, each one of these injuries, what happened, why did it happen, and how can you protect him better in the future? I like that word frustrating because you're right. On a similar note, I'll use to describe Richardson's rookie year, left you wanting more. But I mm -hmm. do think – the way both of us describe it still in a positive way, because like you said, we didn't see a lot. We saw him play a grand total of 173 offensive of snaps. Again, not the number any of us thought we'd be seeing for his rookie year, 
or wanting to see. But in the short time we saw him on the field, there was a lot of positivity, a lot of flashes, a lot of reason for you to believe. So even though it was a very short sample size, again, anytime he got hurt or wasn't playing, it's like, oh man, like he's showing flashes. He's playing well. Like this is exciting football. I want to see more. And that's where it's frustrating in the sense that you don't, you know, you, you kind of get it taken away from you again, outside of one game, you got it taken away from you every single time you stepped on the field, he was unable to finish. And so it was just frustrating in the sense that what you saw was encouraging. I would say more good than bad in his rookie year. The issue is, like you said, like we've been saying, just, you don't see a lot of it. And that's where that frustration does come in. Um, and it, it does, again, leave you kind of just sitting there saying, damn, like at least, I mean, look, it's still, it's concerning that again, we're talking about 16 to 17 games. He will not play in and or, and or uh, not finish a game in. So that's concerning in and of itself, but it is at least encouraging that, you know what, what we did see, if he's able to stay healthy, there's not a lot of doubts, even in the small sample size we saw, um, there's not a lot of doubts of, oh, this guy is able to put it together. And like you said, not overwhelmed, was able to keep the speed of the game a lot. Uh, to bring back what you said earlier, I think you're right about this. There's a lot of boxes that even, again, in the short sample size he played in, a lot of boxes he did check going forward. He feel good about him and his development of, again, hopefully sooner rather than later, rounding into that franchise quarterback form. We talked about it a little bit last week, George, but I kind of want to bring it up now again that we kind of get the end or the resolution to Richardson's future and that it's going to be out for the rest of the season. Do you think, again, 173 snaps, one game fully started and finished, do you think the Colts can say that they learned enough to know potential? Like, do you think... I'm trying to see how I can phrase it. Like, how do you like, do you think the Colts know what they have basically in Richardson um, after his rookie year? I think they do. And I think the biggest sign of that is the Jonathan Taylor deal. You know, I, I think we talked about it at the moment that, that when they brought him in, I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that, Hey, this, this kid's playing better than expected. Uh, this offense has a lot of potential. Let's go ahead and, and sign Taylor up long-term and, and let this partnership grow. Now, Going back to the frustration, they got one snap together, one play, one three-yard run for, for Jonathan Taylor is all we're going to see from the rookie season of, of Anthony Richardson and them together. But I think that move by the Colts was a sign of, you know, I did, we know what we've got. And they really kind of acted that way throughout the offseason. We go back to the controversy about him not playing against, uh, who was that, Chicago? Um in the second the, preseason game, the yeah. Second preseason game when when he done the the uh, joint practices and in retrospect, and I kind of felt that way at the time, but it's it's even more solidified now. That was Shane Steichen saying, "This is the guy. He's ready." And and you saw it when he was out there. Unfortunately, uh, the injuries have caught up to him, um, and, and that's again, you can't change that. But I think they do. I, I, every action that they took really kind of showed that they believe in this guy. And now I think it, it's about putting the pieces around him. It's about getting more weapons out there, which you do with any young quarterback. You know, get him some more weapons, uh, continue to build a, on that defense, and, and see if you can't make something special, like you said, so that by 2032, you know, you're talking about a championship team and, and a quarterback uh, with a long list of accomplishments on his resume. I'm with you in the sense I do think, again, even how short the sample size is, that you could feel good enough about what you have so far after his rookie year. Like, you look, George, at the limited time he's had. He's also faced a lot of different tests. You know, his, his first game against the Jaguars, which, again, right now is the kings of the division, and they have a good offense, good defense. You saw, look, he played pretty well, showed explosive plays with his legs and with his arm, threw an interception in the fourth quarter, and we kind of saw, again, a little bit of maybe the rookie – struggles in that fourth quarter um, in his first game. Then you look at he bounced back, hot start against the Texans. Right away, two touchdowns, took advantage of a turnover in the red zone, was efficient in the red zone. Obviously misses the game against Baltimore, but he comes back. The only game he was able to start and finish was the Rams. And you saw him again after a rough first half and a really rough two and a half quarters where they're down 23 nothing. It's easy to shut the, you know, shut the engine off, say, okay, you know what? Not our day. Let's bounce back. Let's kind of finish the string out of this game, bounce back and learn what we can do to get better. Moving forward, rallies them back to tie the game at 23, go to overtime. Um, had only threw one interception. That was in again the first game against the Jaguars. So he showed a little bit better. Again, was not 
totally confused by defenses, made better decisions, was accurate with the ball, just under 60% completion percentage um, for his rookie year. Like, I think even, even though, again, we're talking about finishing one game and playing parts of four games so far out of 17, I think even in that short sample size, he showed you enough to say going forward here, like, right, he's, we saw what we needed to see to just know going forward here that there's no question. Like, this is like, we're, we are going to be all in on this guy. We've seen plenty of rookie quarterbacks after one year being like, I don't know if we're up there in the draft, we take another quarterback. Like even if the Colts get George a top five pick, let's just say the bottom falls out right with Richardson out, Minshew stinks. And we're talking about a team. They were four, 12 and one last year. I don't know, let's just say five and 11 this year because they already got three wins. Just the bottom falls completely out. I feel very confident in saying if we're talking about a Colts having a top five pick in next year's draft that we're not talking quarterback. And I think that for, for the Colts, um, I think it's a good sign because I'll be honest, by the time draft time came, I still didn't rule out the possibility, even though they took Richardson last year, even after the draft, I didn't rule out the possibility of, you know, next year getting Caleb Williams. If things went South, I think you can say very confidently that, no matter where the Colts end up in the draft next year, that they are not going to be thinking quarterback, which again, it's a credit to Richardson and the short sample size he had showed that he kind of maxed out what he could, you know, and lived up to a lot of potential. We'll say showed the flashes enough to have this team feeling confident that the the project they took could round into form here sooner rather than later. Yeah. It's star for Marv again. Now, I mean, if they're up there, high <laughs> enough, it's going to be, a uh, certain receiver that, that certainly the owner is, is very captivated by uh, and, and most of the fan base for that matter as well. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, there'll be talk outside the organization. There's no question about that. There always is. If they end up there in the top five, people talk about Drake may Michael Penix, you know, whoever you want to throw out there um, that that'll come up. There'll be no question about it. And there'll be people trying to make the case that the injury history uh, you know, scares you and, and and that you should go in that direction. I don't think the team will. Uh, I don't think there'll be any discussion like that within the building, which is what really matters. I mean, outside talk is, is always just outside talk, uh, but it will be interesting, you know, going forward because I think if they do find themselves in that situation and they can't find out, can't fix the health uh, problem, you know, then, then there'll be a lot of people go back to that moment. So it could be a crossroads moment. And I think that's one of the reasons why, in, in Indy's mind, you know, and, and it would be anyway, but it, I think this kind of pushes it even more in the idea of, you know, th- their whole thought process is going to be content, you know, still try to find a way to to win games with Gardner Minshew, uh, which they did prior to this week, uh, you know, against Jacksonville and, and take advantage of what is not a really difficult schedule for the most part. And stay in wild card contention and, and hang around and see what happens. I mean, last year, Tennessee fell apart and it opened the door for Jacksonville to sneak in as, as a division champ. You don't know what the future holds, you know, and Trevor Lawrence knee injury right now is minor. Uh, and but he did have the MRI and he is expected to play Thursday. And I think, you know, by all accounts, that's something that will be taken care of. But, you know, if he's out for an extended period of time, the division all of a sudden is wide open. So you don't know what's going to happen. It's too early in the year to, you know, to tank or or to to do anything like that. Um, But I do think moving forward, and and we've kind of handed this and talked about it before, if they do fall out of contention, if they get to a point where they're not in the wild card chase and you can't realistically, you know, draw a path to playoffs – you do have to start looking at Sam Ellinger or Kellen Mond, I think, and trying to find out if you've got something for the future with them. And you've got a couple of young quarterbacks on the roster. Sam got a little bit of a chance to play last year. Mond hasn't played in this system. We've seen him struggle, you know, elsewhere in the NFL. Uh, it's not like there's a high percentage chance that one of them is, is, is a big time star, but if either one of them is even set up to be a, a viable long-term backup for you, there's value in that. And I think it's worth finding out if you fall out of the race, not right now, not after one bad game from Richardson, not even after, you know, what could be a really rough game against the Browns. We'll get into that more on Thursday, but that's a defense that's doing some historical things right now uh, through the first part of the season. But at some point, if you're three and seven, three and eight, four and nine, you know, whatever those, those numbers look like, uh, then you've got to 
consider making a move and, and taking a look at the young quarterbacks? That so I think it segues perfectly into this discussion about like does the season still matter? Right. Because we've talked a lot on this pod about basically 2023, the wins and losses don't matter. What really matters is the development of Anthony Richardson. And now if he's not there, um, six games into the season, you're still talking about 11 games to go with Gardner Minshew and and uh, a few other backups playing. I think it's easy to say the season doesn't matter and it's irrelevant. You, though, brought up a point where I want to say that the season still matters. Now, again, not in terms of wins or losses. I honestly, frankly, could care less about playoff contention. But what I do care about and why I think the season is still important, George, is because it kind of goes back to what we just talked about. I think the Colts learned enough in the short time that Anthony Richardson played to where 2024, again, even though this is a guy that will, assuming he's out for the rest of the year, we're going to be talking about a guy this upcoming offseason going into next year that has, again, one game under his belt where he started and finished. You could easily argue, well, then 2024, with how much time Richardson has missed, he's basically a rookie because he's, when you only play and finish one game, you still have so much to learn that basically you can argue easily that 2024 is just basically a repeat of his rookie year and 2023 was, for lack of a better term, a redshirt year uh, for him. But I think because Richardson showed you some signs and, and again, I think answered some questions early on in the limited time he played, not that next year is a playoff team or that you're going to say, oh, playoffs are bust. But I think you can honestly go into next year saying, you know what, this could be a scrappy team and maybe 500 is, is you know, the goal and, and winning seven, eight, maybe nine games next year, depending on how the schedule looks like. I think you can kind of start to chart out those sort of expectations I think to get there, it's not only just the quarterback, right? It's everyone else. And I think one of the biggest things that we saw with this or we have seen so far through six games of this team is the fact that Richardson, right? Here's a hot take for you, George, needs help. Now, JT coming back, it obviously is huge. And like you said, outside of one handoff um, and a very limited amount of snaps in the backfield, we didn't see that at all this year. And that's hopefully something that develops next year. But if Richardson's going to have success and take that next step next year, it's going to be also aided by receivers stepping up and playing better. Michael Pittman Jr., Alec Pierce, Josh Downs taking a step as well. Maybe you go out again. If you draft someone, maybe you go big and trade for wide receiver. I'm getting help there. It's a tight end making more a more consistent presence. It's the offense line who's been really good and I think improved so far this year through six games. Still taking another step and still trying to get back to that 2020, 2021 level of dominance. They're not there yet, but still kind of getting on that trajectory. And so even though Richardson, that's a long way of saying, even though Richardson's not going to be the quarterback, and even though we said for the most part 2023 in large part is going to be about his development, even with him not there, I think development, especially offensively, at the skill positions and the offensive line is still worth watching to the point where now 2023, again, the wins and losses, I don't think, you know, matter as much. I don't think it's a, a failure or disappointment if the Colts are out of playoff contention, even by the time they get to the bye, frankly. Um with the schedule the way it is. But if you could see now, I think it's still worth watching. How do these receivers play? Can anyone truly step up here um, and kind of really, you know, make their presence known, kind of take a stranglehold on the position going forward to where you feel good about them in 2024? I think in large part, George, to your point, going back to if, you know, if we're talking about them at the bye, after four more games, maybe they're one in three in the the next four game stretch here. We're talking about them out of playoff contention. I think you're 100% right in terms of going to Ellinger, going to Mond, not because they're better than Minshew, but because those seven games coming out of the bye, what it does is, though Ellinger, Mond, whoever, it allows you to run a similar offense to what Richardson will be running in 2024 and beyond. So even though Richardson is not there, you still allow the offense to run the same as if he was there. And again, practice getting those reps, running certain routes, running certain concepts and schemes to, again, round yourself better into form and kind of, again, by the time 2024 comes, hopefully hit the ground running versus run an offense with Gardner Minshew for the rest of the year and then relearn or reacclimate yourself to a different offense with Anthony Richardson in the offseason. I think it'll be interesting to watch, you know, how they respond. And I think that's one of the things uh, through these first five games, six games, the fight that this team has, you know, that's what we were talking about. And I saw Shane Steichen bring that up. Uh, well, the the broadcasters brought it up through him that, that he had talked to them about it, you know, during the the meetings before the game. Uh, that that's that's what he's like best, and and that's what's marked this team. And I think that's absolutely true. 
I think that's what matters for the rest of the season. Can they continue, even though you lost your quarterback and you, you know, have again, you're back where you were in week one, where, where people aren't expecting anything from you. Uh, you're coming off the worst loss of the season. Um, you know, things could not have gone much more poorly in Jacksonville than they did. Uh, and, and as usual, because that seems to be the case every time they go down there, but how do you respond? You know, and I think that's why I think the Cleveland game in particular is huge in that regard, because you're going to face a defense that right now through five, they've only played five. So through five games, no one's allowed fewer yards in, in the NFL in the last 50 years than their number, which is, I mean, you just think about that. It's incredible. My lifetime, and I'm an old man. No one has a few allowed fewer yards uh, in, in the NFL through five games. So, you know, I think how they respond against Cleveland is important, but even moving forward, there's still a path to seven or eight wins for this team. When you look at the schedule, Carolina, New England, the Raiders, Tennessee again, Houston again at the end of the year, the, you know, these teams that they've either already beaten or that you can go into the game saying, okay, the, you know, they may be favored or at least have a really, you know, at least a 50% chance of winning the game. And other games like the Saints uh, that are maybe just sort of on the on the fence there that, that could go either way, that's what I want to see. Can Shane Steichen continue to instill his personality and, and his character into this team? Will they continue to fight? Because they didn't last year. We saw that go away specifically after the coaching change. Uh, you know, we, we keep coming back to that Giants game hmm. and, you know, doing snow angels on the field next to your injured quarterback. They cannot let it get back there. That to me is one of the importance of the season. There were winnable games last year down the stretch when they lost seven in a row. I mean, not going to go back through some of those moments, but you had a lot of games that they lost either by a point or they blew a big lead in, or they had, you know, a drive late that they could have taken it over. And to me, with a, with a rookie quarterback, rookie head coach still, who is still learning his way in the NFL too, that's the value to me. Can Shane Sykin show that, okay, even without my number one guy, the guy that we built this offense around, I can still go out there and win some close games and limp to a 7-9 and nine finish or maybe even – or 8-9 and nine finish – you know, maybe even nine and eight if, if you get all the breaks. I think there's value in that, not because the record's important, but because of the tone that it sets moving forward. He has come in here with this no excuses mantra that, you know, these these are not expectations. They're more or less edicts. This is what we're going to do as a football team. And now there's a real test for that. If he can get them to still be competitive, to win the winnable games, I think it says a lot about him moving forward, and I think that helps Anthony Richardson moving forward because it's going to help the team moving forward. That, I think, is a big distinction why this year is still different than last year and why I don't think tanking uh, and rooting for losses this year is as prevalent and as important as it was last year. Like last year, again, this team was hopeless, right? You you hire Jeff Saturday. You have three quarterbacks on the roster that you know next year, you know, in 2023, when we're talking about last year, there's no chance of them being on the roster and that that you know, you're basically going to overhaul a lot of the important pieces on your team, which is why last year it was directionless, rudderless, helpless, hapless. You know, there's a million adjectives we could use for last year, the last nine games of the season, as to why losses were still better for this team than wins. You mentioned before Star for Marv, right? Try to get a top pick to try to land Marvin Harrison Jr. and really give AR that insane hopefully number one receiver that he does need going forward here but I think because of what you just said and again the carryover to where a lot of these guys are going to be on the team next year I think it does the Colts more good to still go out there compete hard and win seven games than it would for the bottom to drop out and then win five if you can like you said it brings some any sort of momentum um to next year even if that means you go from the fifth pick overall to the 12th pick overall I still think there's more value and more positivity from a mindset, from a belief perspective going into 2024 versus, again, going two and nine the last 11 games of the season, getting a top pick, maybe getting a bona fide stud at receiver, but kind of almost starting from scratch all over again in terms of belief, in terms of competing, in terms of playing hard. Like, think about it, George. Right? If we're talking about a team that's seven and 10, um, which I think is. I can't do the math right now. It's too early. So like, I'm sorry. Uh, I will think about here in a second. 
how you forced up and down the stretch. Thank you. Thank you. Um, how you go down the stretch here, it's like that's still, I think you would feel good about that going now. It's okay. So we still played hard. Now you put Anthony Richardson back in and you think, okay, maybe one or two additions, you can start to believe this team can again be a a legitimate just contender in general going forward. I think that is still a better route for this team than losing as much as you can, tanking after week six. Um, and basically trying to have that loser mentality for the rest of the year in order to get a top pick. I I think it's a I think it's easy for people to say, oh, tank wait, Richardson's out, who cares? Just like lose, 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 and then try to get a top pick. I think preaching winning, even no matter who's in there, I think that has a greater effect of positivity going forward than saying lose, 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 lose. And then all of a sudden, as soon as week 18's over and you get that top five pick you want flip the switch and say, okay, now we're going to try to win. I don't think it's as easy to go from losing to winning as it is saying, well, the standard, no matter who's there, doesn't change. We're going to finish the season out hard and tough. And if that means we're eight and nine and cost ourselves a chance at getting Marvin Harrison Jr., but we instill confidence and teach these guys how to win because it's still a young offense, especially, or young offense. Yeah, in terms of pieces that you think are going to be around for a while, I think still holding that bar high is a bigger positive for the future than getting a top five pick. Yeah, well, and setting the culture for this head coach, you know, right. I mean, so that everybody else is believing. You don't want to send the message to the locker room that you're dependent on the quarterback and that if he's not here, all hope is lost and you're just going to give up the fight and, you know, move on to the next year. You want to send the message to the locker room that these are the expectations and they don't change. And that, because again, if, if seven and 10 is a good number to use, if they're seven and 10 at the end of the year and they were competitive in the losses and they got some wins uh, that, that gave you some hope. And then you're adding Anthony Richardson back into that. There's, it's a different feel. And you're going to feel like, hey, Shane Sykin's done some good things. He's set a good foundation. You can keep the quarterback healthy. Who knows what's possible next year? And that's that's the mindset. It's a different mindset altogether if you're 5 and 12 and you right. were struggling and, and you didn't finish out the year with, with any kind of positivity at all. Uh, because you're not, you know, one of the things that, that helped them overcome that this year is the coaching change. You had a fresh start. You could put everything behind you. That's not going to happen next year. Whatever happens, you know, at the end of this year, there's going to be baggage from that that's carried over. Because like you said, the roster is is pretty much uh, a lot of it's going to be back. Let's put it that way. And, and the coaching staff's going to be back. So, uh, and I think there's also, you know, offensively, yeah, you want to see them grow and learn how to win games. Defensively, you got those two rookie cornerbacks. You want them to continue to grow and improve. And, and you know, there's a lot of more pressure on the defense now than there was when, when Anthony Richardson's healthy. They've got to go out there and, and, and cause turnovers and get short fields and, you know, be a major part of winning games, not just hold on to leads, you know, get after the quarterback when you're ahead. This has got to be a defense that goes out and, and forces the issue and is, is part of the reason that they want it. And I think you just look around the league. Cleveland just beat the 49ers. Granted, there's a missed field goal at the end. Just beat the 49ers with P.J. Walker. You know, the Colts cannot say, oh, well, we, we've got Gardner Minshew and we have no hope. He's 3-1 and one in, in game. The team's 3-1 and one in, in, in games that he's played significant portions of this year. So, yeah, the Jacksonville loss, absolutely wretched. Everybody feels correctly depressed and, and frustrated and upset with that game. But I think it's about now moving forward, proving that that was a fluke. That was that that's not going to be the rest of the way the season goes. And I think that's why, too, like kind of circle back to how we started this, even though we we put so many eggs in the basket of 2023 being about Richardson's development, there are still reasons to watch, still reasons to care about this team going forward, because I think you said now it's about like even with them playing hard and being, if you want to say, stuck in the middle at seven and ten record wise, that's still, I think even though most would agree and think correctly that being stuck in the middle is the worst spot to be in sports for this specific team, this specific year, like I said, finish playing going four and seven down the stretch with the, you know, again, combo of Gardner Minshew, Sam Ellinger. We'll see, you know, how it does break down, but maybe a, at least one, possibly two or three different quarterbacks playing that are not your starter. Still think it, it sends a better message going forward here and still carries more momentum into 2024 versus just letting the bottom drop out waving the white flag. It's an, ah, you know what? Bad luck. We'll see, you know, we'll see you next year. Let's just kind of play out the string, get healthy, and then 
where by next year when it comes, like I said, I think there's just too much still positivity to come out of this season and still too much building um, going forward here to where even though a large part of what 2023 was about is now gone with Richardson out for the year, still some reasons to watch. It's still areas to develop where if they do develop, that means Colts are winning games. And that means you could feel positive about, you know, the receiver group, the defensive back group, like I said, who's very inexperienced. Like there's still, I think so much positivity and still many, you know, still questions to answer that if you do answer, feel pretty good about going forward. Even if that means you lose out on a top five pick, it's still worth it. Um, going forward and still again the best interest of this team uh for the future versus again last year where, where it's a head coach you know it's not gonna be back quarterback not gonna be back it was just a different vibe different culture that it did not matter as much in terms of wins and losses as i think it does this year and at least flat out like you said competing as well um one other question here george kind of put a bow on richardson um and his health i want to go back to something shane Sykett said last monday after the tennessee win but obviously that was also marred by the Richardson injury. He was asked, Shane Sykin, that is on the Monday press conference, with Richardson now getting hurt again and being out at that point for an indefinite amount of time, do you have to change the way the offense works and do you have to change Anthony Richardson's playing style as a dual threat quarterback? Shane Sykin said to that uh, question, quote, we'll cross that bridge when it gets time, end quote. Well, obviously, it looks like we're not going to have an answer or we're not going to approach that bridge this year with Richardson being out for the year, George. So next year, let me ask you this. Do the Colts have to change their offensive style at all when their dual throw quarterback starts and finishes one game out of 17? To an extent, but, you know, at the end of the day, you you can't take away what makes him special. You drafted him to to do these things. Uh, you see it in Baltimore. You know, they, they switch around some things and, and they're going through struggles now. Because, you know, they're, they're trying to be more of a pass-oriented team and, and use Lamar Jackson's legs less. And, and it's, you know, we'll see ultimately how it, how it works out. But right now, it's a rough process. There's still a lot of ups and downs as, as they're trying to do that. And, you know, I, I think there's a lot of things that, that you can do that aren't necessarily run him less. Because I, I still don't think he ran that much. I mean, I keep hearing that. And I'm like, he really didn't run a ton. It wasn't you know, he wasn't taking off every one out of every three dropbacks. When you hear people talk, it almost sounds like that was the case. He really wasn't, you know, he, he really wasn't running a crazy amount. And I think that number will be even lower with a healthy Jonathan Taylor uh, for most of the, the year, you know, behind him. If you feel like you've got that running game early on this year, I think he ran a little more than, than you would normally want him to. Because the running game wasn't getting going, but even as Zach Moss got hot, you saw him. They they dialed that back. I mean, the injury against Tennessee was the second time he ran in that game. It wasn't like he was being put in harm's way a lot. I, I think a lot of this has to do going forward with taking some of the stress off of his shoulders, and that goes back back to what we were talking about earlier: finishing this year well, getting these guys around him to grow and understand their roles, but. Having Jonathan Taylor, who's going to be here now for the next three years after this year, uh, having him be a big part of the offense, having him take on some of that load, having a guy like Josh Downs continue to grow and become a hot read and be a guy that, you know, when there's pressure, you can you can go to him. I think those are the things he's got to learn. It's not so much run less as it is play smart in general, just just understanding uh, you know, Peyton Manning was the king of, of not taking unnecessary hits just going down sometimes when, when the pass rush, the play was over. That's where Anthony's got to get, you know, if that means getting out of bounds a yard or two early, so be it. If it means sliding, you know, what, whatever that means, if it means dropping down and when, when the pass rush comes through and not trying to fight through a play, you know, his skill sets obviously different than Peyton Manning's. And so you're going to react uh, in, in different situations differently, but it's just, I think all of those little things factor into this reading the defense better as he's getting more experience and he's been in there longer, you know, both in terms of getting rid of the ball faster, which helps you in this case, obviously, but also in terms of understanding, Hey, Harold Landry's that defensive end. There's a good chance. He's going to close here. I need to be prepared for this hit. You know, things like that uh, are, are going to come along with this, but I think a lot of it, honestly, as far as changing how the offense works and changing play style is don't, don't put that Superman cape on him. Don't make him be, uh, you know, 
more than than he needs to be to to help this team win. Give him that help. Let him get the ball into the playmakers' hands, and I think a lot of that will will go a long way towards keeping him healthier. I don't think right. I don't think that there's a reason to change the play style for a few reasons. Number one, look again. His injuries, I don't want to say were fluky, but they kind of were fluky when you actually look at how they were suffered and the severity. It's just like it's one of those where it's not. I think they'll improve going forward. Like I said, the concussion is just one of those where he, I think he's going to learn not to pull up for the end zone, run through it. The um, ru- the run, he got hurt against the Titans. I think it's one of those where he learned, unfortunately, the hard way, the speed of the NFL and truly how fast even guys that are heavier than him um, at defensive end, how truly fast they are and how quickly they get up on you. So those are two, you know, two specific injuries right there where I do think just him getting a little bit more experience will will happen less in terms of kind of being a little bit smarter and protecting yourself. But it's also too, like to your point, he ran 25 times total uh, in his four games that he has played, um, played in the two games. He's played the most, right? The Jacksonville game week, number one, and then the Rams game, the only game he finished, it was 10 carries each. But I think in large part, to your point, a large part of the reason why the two games he played the most was 20 combined carries was out of necessity because week one, you had Deion Jackson being your leading rusher. And he, I think it was what 13 carries for 14 yards. That's not sustainable. The only explosive ground game they got was from him. So that was just more, well, you have no threat of a run game whatsoever. Let's just try to get some sort of spark. And Richardson provided that. Also, then um, you have the emergence of Zach Moss and the return of Jonathan Taylor, which again, outside of one handoff, Richardson didn't get to have any of that at all. So you assume next year that he'll have, okay, one of the best running backs in the league next to him. Hopefully, you know, if Moss is back or some sort of like good one, a, um, Canada to Jonathan Taylor, those two guys right there take pressure and reps off of Richardson's plate in terms of running the ball because you think you will be able to establish the run and not need your quarterback to do so. And also, to your point, like you said before, I don't think you now get scared over what are flukish injuries and take away the main reason why you drafted Richardson in the first place. Now, he was drafted fourth overall, not because he was the most polished product in the world, not because he read the defense at an elite level. They drafted him fourth overall, despite having 13 career starts and being up and down in Florida his only year as a starter because of the potential, because of how he puts defenses in a bind with his blazing speed, insane size, and monster arm. I think you're the Colts. It's a little scary, a little frustrating that, again, he, he started and finished one game in his rookie year. But those concerns, I think, are also masked or, or overwhelmed by the fact that if this guy could put it together, we are like, I don't, George, I don't think it's hyperbolic to say he could be the most talented quarterback in the NFL if if he reaches his ceiling. And that's why you drafted him. Yeah, and we talked about that on draft day, that, that you know, literally the ceiling for him is is face of the, of the league. You know, it, and if he gets 75% of the way there, he's going to be a really, right. really good quarterback. Uh, so I, I think... To me, I look at the numbers. I mean, we were talking in the preseason pod, and people can go back and check this. You know, how many touchdowns are, are realistic for him? I had a really low number. Now, we're not going to know where it ended up because he only played about a quarter of the season, but we do know in four games he created seven touchdowns. He had four rushing touchdowns and three passing touchdowns. You don't sneeze at that kind of production. And I, to me – you don't do anything to, to to take that away. And and those are the touchdowns that he's directly, you know, credited for. I give him a lot of credit for the 56-yard Zach Moss touchdown run because if you watch the defense on that play, there were two defenders that were frozen because he was there. And they ran the, the play fake at you know, the start of that. They never went to Zach Moss's side of the field because they were going with Anthony Richardson. And it – if he's not running, you take that away as well. So, yes, you've got to be smart with it. There's no question about that. No one's going to say, hey, just, you know, just go out there willy-nilly and let him run whenever he wants and take no protections whatsoever. Like, that's not obviously going to happen. But I do think you – and and Shane Steichen has said this several times. It's nothing new. Uh, you pick your spots. And I think that's what – that some of that comes with experience too, understanding, okay, now is the time – uh, where, you know, take a shot, call a design run for him. But I do think if you watch a Florida tape, I'm not that concerned going forward about him as a runner because, again, if you go back and watch his college tape, 
more often than not, he stayed in the pocket and he looked downfield and he, and he wanted to make a big play that way. And I think it's going to develop that way at the NFL level as well. Uh, but the the biggest thing the Colts can do for him is to give him that help around it. You know, and signing Jonathan Taylor was the first step in that. Now re-signing Michael Pittman and adding another weapon to this receiving core is the next step. And I think that's what they've got to continue to do going forward. And then, you know, bolstering, continue to bolster that defense. If you have all of those elements around him, he's going to take less risks because he's not going to have to, to do as many insane things to, you know, in his mind to help win a game. But at the same time, when you've got a guy who can produce seven touchdowns in four games, three of them he didn't finish, you don't want to mess with that too much either. Like, I don't like – one word I would not use to describe his rookie year and his style of play is reckless. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's a, a reason why I don't think you have to change much if you're the Colts going forward here because like a guy who's been compared to a lot coming out of college and his similar style is Josh Allen. I would say, honestly, for how good Josh Allen has been and how durable Josh Allen has been, he's he still to this day plays recklessly. And so if you're the Bills, I still think there's a big fear in the back of your mind of Josh Allen's, frankly, stupidity with how he sometimes throws his body at defenders and does not protect himself, you are afraid it's going to come back to bite you in a big way. Again, injuries happen, and this is a guy that we're talking about only finished one game, but it's like you look at how he got injured, it's not like he didn't – sliding has to improve. But it's also not like when he ran around the edge, he didn't run out of bounds. Like he said, oh, like we saw Andrew Luck his rookie year say, oh, there's the sideline. Well, screw that. I'm going to go put my shoulder into this linebacker running at me, and I'm going to just try to run him over. Richardson has done a good job of getting out of bounds at least and not trying to sacrifice his body for an extra two yards, which in the grand scheme of things doesn't actually matter. Like get out of bounds, save your shoulder, save your body. The one or two yard you can gain by trying to run over defenders, not worth it. I think for Richardson, again, sliding in the field can help a little bit, but he's run out of bounds. You see how he's gotten hurt. It's one of those where just you almost just learn the speed of the game, which is going to come with experience. When you are not playing as recklessly as he is, and I think the injuries, I hate to use this because it's not really like a tangible thing we can measure, but it's kind of frankly just luck in terms of how he's gotten hurt and how he's fallen. I don't think you got to change his playing style and the way if you're Shane Syke and how you call a game or run an offense based on what has been, I would say, through four games, bad injury luck. Yeah, I, I agree. Luck played recklessly. I mean, that, yeah. that was a different situation altogether. He'd throw an interception. He's the first one trying to make the tackle. He's getting his nose right in there. Uh, you know, that that's that was Andrew Luck's style. And, and you haven't seen that from Anthony Richardson. Um, I do think, to me, it's tweaks. It's not an overhaul. There's just little things that you can do here and there that, that need to be done, whether it's me reading a play or a situation better like maybe you cut back a run instead of going to the edge you know because it's safer for you you know you just got it little things like this uh that that'll work but a lot of it too is is just luck i mean who knows if he falls a different way he finishes that game against tennessee we're not having this conversation right now you know but unfortunately the way he gets tackled his shoulder gets driven into the turf and you know, now one good thing, because the tweak I keep mentioning is they need to change the surface. I have been told that is happening. It's not putting in grass, but there's going to be a uh, the U.S. swim trials. U.S. Olympic swim trials are going to be at Lucas Oil this spring. Okay. Uh, out of the Olympics, obviously, in, in Paris. Uh, and so they've got to bring in a pool. It's going to be a really big thing. I don't know how that's going to work. That's going to be incredible. Yeah, interesting. Olympics. But they're using that time they're going to put in a new surface after that so once swim trials come in and then they have to put a field back down it will be a new surface so it won't be grass so it's not going to be all the way there but hopefully it's a better surface uh, a softer surface and that should help a little bit too because two of these injuries happened at home and happened on that turf the bruised knee and the shoulder and maybe a better surface. I don't know, but maybe a better surface does give you a better chance there uh, and helps improve your injury luck a little bit. I mean, again, his head snapped back. So grass or turf, that's a hard way for your head to fall. But the concussion too was on turf in Tennessee, uh, in Houston, excuse me. Again, with the way he fell back, I don't know if anything's changing with grass, but that's encouraging because I'm pretty sure, right? The NFLPA said this, the Colts have the worst type of turf in the league yeah. you could have. 
there's only four teams that, that fell under. I don't remember the other three. Uh, there's only four teams that, that have that kind of turf still uh, that the league says is the bottom of the barrel. So at least that's going to improve. And then those are the things that, that need to happen. Uh, and again, tweaks, not overhauls. Well, like it sounds like Jim Arce listened to the pod because you were all over that. So again, not the exact wish of wanting grass, but okay. So we got better turf. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know which turf is the best. Uh, I know. I mean, the word the Jets and Giants at MetLife, I know is also awful. So I don't know if the Colts have similar to them, but whatever, whatever it is, model yourself after getting some great turf. And hopefully, like I said, that's a small difference. I don't know if it's more rubber pellets, whatever it is, George, more padding underneath the turf, whatever it takes to, again, prevent maybe one injury out of the three said so you'll absolutely take and could go be the difference between honestly a Super Bowl potentially or not depending on how again how well Anthony Richards is playing if you can keep him healthy on the field so far a lot to like that's for sure finally here to just talk about the Colts now going forward George to wrap up this pod without you know life without Anthony Richardson we talked a lot on the post game pod on Sunday about the run pass disparity or discrepancy where the Colts attempted 55 passes. It was almost three to one pass to run. They really did not try to run the ball whatsoever. And I really liked what Ryan Kelly had to say, George, on Monday kind of to explain the reason why the pass calls were so heavy. And that was the fact that he basically said the Jaguars, no matter what formation the Colts were in, they could have one receiver, they could have five receivers. Did not matter. The Jaguars played four down linemen, three linebackers, basically seven guys in the box, no matter what formation the Colts ran out of. You never really see that in the NFL because it's so much matchup based. So if there are four receivers on the field, you'll see teams bringing their nickel, bringing their dime, bring three, four, five, six defensive backs on the field to match up with the speed that most teams will have on offense. The Jaguars said, screw it. We're stacking the box. Like you said before, we're not allowing you to run the ball, which they accomplished. The Colts couldn't run the ball to save their life whatsoever. And they dared the Colts to beat them, beat them deep. And we saw, again, outside of, two or three passes the Colts could not do that consistently even by the time they were able to do so the game was already over the Jaguars dare the Colts to pass and beat them deep and the Colts could not do it in that loss I think what Ryan Kelly talked about number one is really interesting because if you have four receivers that means well you have five offensive linemen no real extra blockers there to do it over the run game so if you're talking about five down linemen versus seven guys in the box you're not running the ball and having success running the ball and if you can't push the ball deep like we saw the Colts not be able to do well. There's no reason why the Browns, the saints, any team now going forward should deviate what the Jaguars did. It's kind of one of those chicken or the egg situations, George of if the Colts want to have more explosion. Is it going to be established the run, open up the pass, but it seems like if they want to get some sort of balance, it's going to have to be push the ball deep down the field to open up the run game. And it's going to be tough to do with Gardner Mitchell. That's not the strength Very. of his game. But he has done it better than, you know, at other stops. He's done it better than, than he has here. Uh, right now, he's got a career low of, I think, 5.8 yards per attempt. Uh, if you look back through the rest of his career, it's been in that seven plus seven range, which is where they want it to be. That could change a lot. You know, if you, if you can get back there, you know, what has to happen there? Do they have to scheme people open a little bit more? Do they have to? they got to get more yards after the catch. I mean, that that's where it's going to go. You're not going to do a lot of that through the air. Uh, you saw a little bit of it. You just didn't see enough of it on Sunday. Uh, the 40-yard pass to Michael Pittman, obviously more of that would be good. But even the 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 40-yard swing pass to, to Jonathan Taylor, where you get a lot of yards after catch, and the 45-yarder to uh, Kylan Granson, that was about half and half. You know, th- those are the kind of things that, that they've got to get more of. Uh, the problem is you had – Three passes go for 40 yards or more. The other 52 passes, they average 3.9 yards per attempt on, uh, which is not, I mean, that's a bad rushing average. So obviously that's not per completion, but that's, it's a number that that Frank Reich always looked at. I know it's one that Shane Sykin has told us is important to him because it, it speaks to offensive efficiency. And I can't remember, I was trying to find it real quick here on Twitter. I can't remember who it was. I wanted to to look up that number to give him credit, but those the defense that, that you were talking about staying in that formation, having seven guys versus five. The Colts did try to run five times against that look. They gained nine yards on those five runs, uh, so not even two yards per carry, which is you know they were two point six for the game. They're even worse when they tried it in those situations. So yeah, you're gonna have to open that up 
uh, and whatever that means, whatever that looks like, you're going to have to find ways to do it uh, because I guarantee you Cleveland's looking at this and, and they're going to do something similar. New Orleans, if it works for the Browns, is going to do something similar. Carolina, New England, it's not going to end until you find a way to move the ball against that look. And that's why I think even though a lot of fans are upset about the the play calling discrepancy between pass and run, I think we're going to see that pattern carry forward here because teams are going to basically dare and force the Colts to pass out of those heavy box looks in order to try to establish the run. Like I said, if you have the, the math, just doesn't make any sense. If you have seven guys in the box and five, maybe if you have a tight end, um, six guys to block you, like the numbers don't add up saying, Oh yeah, run the ball. When you are that outmanned, it does not make any sense. And you can't expect, like I said, when you try to do that five times for nine yards, that's exactly right. That's not even on the offensive line. Um, It's also just, frankly, again, a numbers game where the defense has the advantage. You're not going to get a lot of um, explosive runs or just consistency when you are consistently one or two guys outmanned in that specific zone. And with defenses basically daring the Colts receivers to go one-on-one and not trust them to break free, which we did not see really a ton of separation against the Jaguars receiver-wise, and also didn't help the fact that there was the DBs were not afraid of any pass over 10 yards and that goes to Gardner Minshew. It's one of those things where, again, if, if your offense is going to be 10 yards and in George, there's no reason why defender or why defenses are not going to just stack the box because even though they're stacking the box, to stop the run where the Colts are passing the ball underneath and having Zach Moss and Jonathan Taylor account for 11 receptions, basically a third of the receiving receptions goes to running backs, just basically dump offs. Then, then you're basically again playing right into the defense's hands because they're playing up front and you're throwing the ball even when you are up front right in the teeth of the defense. It's going to be on Minshew. Again, maybe if you make a quarterback change on Ellinger, on Mond, the only way that they're going to get defenses out of these heavy looks and try to open up any sort of run lanes is by opening the, you know, pushing the ball deep and getting consistent success. Or like you said, having receivers break tackles and taking a five-yard pass and making it a 25-30 50 yard gain just because you you break one tackle all of a sudden you think you should be gone now if there's a lot of these one-on-one routes this is going to be on Minshew but also on the receivers here to make to just win some battles frankly yeah well I mean it's it's blatant disrespect by the defense for the passing game I mean there's no other way to put that when they go out there and they line up like that consistently when you put five receivers on the field and they still line up like that that is blatant disrespect for the passing game and your quarterback and your wide receivers have to to take that personally and they have to take advantage of it uh and I think we'll see going forward you know how the Colts respond to that but they've got to get the ball out to the perimeter more there's no question about that whether that's play calling or decision making by the quarterback I don't know that because I'm not in the huddle, but either way, it's got to change. They've got to get the ball out to the perimeter more because obviously the box is stacked like that. There's more room outside uh, and and try to make plays that way. So uh, to me, if I'm a wide receiver, if I'm Gardner Minshew, I'm taking that. I'm looking at that tape. I'm taking that personally, and I'm coming into the Cleveland game saying, if if you give us that look, you're going to pay for it because that in the NFL – you absolutely have to make defenses pay for for doing that. Uh, and if you don't, well, then it's, it's going to be a long day. It's 100% disrespectful, but it's also 100% the right defensive strategy. Mm-hmm. And oh, that's absolutely. Right? And it goes back to kind of what we talked about before, about this season, even without Anthony Richardson being there, still yeah. being important and still wanting to see success. Because, again, if, if, if we're talking about now 11 games left, Nine of the 11 defenses, let's just say, roughly run the similar defense to what Jacksonville did and basically put receivers on and out and say, we dare you to win one-on-one. We know you can't and or we know you're not going to throw deep. And the Colts don't win those matchups. you got decisions then to make in the offseason. Like, if we're talking Michael Pittman Jr., again, who did win some one-on-one matchups late in the game, did have over 100 yards receiving. But if we're talking about him losing a lot of these battles more times than winning when they're just going to put him on an island, like it, just, it, it can answer questions going forward here about who's going to stay and who's going to go in terms of helping Richardson get the best weapons around him. This is a great test for these receivers, for these tight ends, even for these running backs in space. When defense is basically daring you say, hey, look, you got to make a play here to win the game and make multiple plays. Who steps up and who doesn't, George, I think is still something to absolutely watch for going forward. It can help shape your roster decision-making process in 2024 and beyond when Richardson does return. 
Yeah, and credit to Michael Pittman. He had nine catches, you know, about a quarter of the receptions in that game at 109 yards. He was one of the few guys winning his his one-on-one matchups. They've got to get Josh Downs to do it. He mm-hmm. had five catches. Uh, it's tougher for him over the middle, obviously, because that's where everybody is. So when he gets that catch, he's not going to have a lot of – yards after the catch and you saw that with his numbers on on sunny at five catches but i think it was only like 20 odd number yeah. yards very uh, low he gets first touchdown uh and you know you've got it you've got to win those battles gardner's got to get rid of the ball quick which he has most of the year uh, got to get rid of the ball quickly he's got to make good decisions with the ball and when the there is an opportunity there like when Pittman's wide open uh, i think it was third quarter and he just throws the ball 10 yards over his head right to a defender you know, you, you got to take advantage of those open receivers uh, and you got to make those plays. You got to do it consistently. You got to get the defense out of those looks. It's going to be hard because they're going to come into the game saying Jonathan Taylor and Zach Moss scare us the most and they're not going to beat us. I mean, any defensive coordinator worth having a job in the NFL is going to approach it that way. Uh, but to go to the length that the Jaguars did, it's disrespectful and the Colts have got to respond to that. And you look again, 2024 and beyond, how much better this offense could be if defenses are fearing Jonathan Taylor, obviously Anthony Richardson's dual threat ability. But now if you also go in saying, oh boy, well, Michael Pittman Jr. wins a lot of these one-on-one matchups. Alec Pierce, if, if we put him one-on-one, he goes deep. He's winning a lot of these jump balls. Like, again, you can you make defenses think. And if you have three or four different threats uh, that defenses have to worry about and try to take away in any given game, it just makes – your offense so much easier to execute and makes it more efficient because there's so many different variables and so many different factors you can, you know, or just weapons to throw the ball to. Like we kind of see with the 49ers, it's our Brock Purdy so damn good outside of this week, you know, against the Browns, but it's not because Brock Purdy is a great quarterback, but because he has so many guys that can win one-on-one matchups that he has three or four options that he knows, Oh, this is definitely a mismatch. I'll take advantage of this. If the Colts can get to that level um, with Anthony Richardson next year, hopefully, in terms of having two or three different guys, he knows any given any given play, any given game. Oh, I can trust and rely on that they'll win their one-on-one matchup, win a battle. If I just give them the ball, they'll go make a play. Again, it makes Richardson's life easier, takes pressure off of him and his body about trying to make plays himself, and makes this Colts offense really tough to slow down and really tough to defend. And again, if you're able to make plays with Gardner Minshew, a quarterback, if you're Pierce, Pittman, Downs, and you got to think that you'll be able to make even more plays and bigger explosive plays now when you have Richardson return next year, which is, again, a, a big reason to watch and look out for going forward here. Why this season, George, still does matter. You still now need to make plays, and you still got to give the front office and your quarterback faith going to next year, hey, they trust me to win on win this matchup. More times than not, I'll win it. Absolutely. Absolutely. The receivers have got to – a really heavy load on their shoulders the rest of the way because they've got to get yards after the catch. They've got to win their one-on-one battles. Uh, They've got to help out their quarterback because we know that Gardner does some things very well. Uh, He's going to get rid of the ball fast. Uh, Most of the time he takes care of it. He didn't on Sunday, but I'll give him benefit of the doubt for now that that was a one-game blip because we haven't seen it from him consistently. Uh, You know, they've got to go and and, and help him out in the areas that, that he isn't as strong and that will open up the running game, and then you can carry. You let Jonathan Taylor and Zach Moss carry you, uh, but you got to get there first. And, and I think that's that's a challenge going forward. And for Shane Sykin, who's been a very creative guy, who's done a really good job with the offense, he didn't get it done on Sunday against Jacksonville. He'll be the first to admit that. And now you saw it. You know what to expect. You know what Cleveland's going to do. How do you respond? How do you respond? It's going to be a brutal test on Sunday for sure as the Browns and that number one defense do come to town. Um, But definitely something to watch for without a doubt. And again, even though we started this podcast on a down note in the sense that Jim Merce telling ESPN amongst other outlets that Richardson probably will get surgery and most likely will be out for the rest of the regular season in 2023. Still a lot to watch out for, like we just kind of highlighted. Still a lot of reasons to be invested in this team because I think a lot of what we see now with 11 games left going forward, George could be a lot of reasons for hopefully optimism, but also maybe some questions of pessimism too, may how they play going to 2024 and where this offense specifically could be next year. So still a lot to watch out for still a lot of reason 
to watch and listen to the Blue Horseshoe Podcast. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube if you haven't, Blue Horseshoe Pod. Also, make sure you check out uh, wherever you get your podcasts, Blue Horseshoe Podcast. Bright blue logo is where our feed is, where every new episode is dropped three times a week, Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday. Well, Sunday is only a YouTube exclusive post game, so make sure you do check that out as well. We will be back on Thursday to kind of, I mean, try to find answers, George. <laughs> figure out if there is a weakness to the to the Browns defense and how they do exploit it. It's going to be tough sledding uh, defensively, probably easily, definitely, I should say, the toughest challenge this team is going to face all season uh, with that loaded Browns defense on all three levels. So we'll try to figure out some answers on where the Colts can take advantage of the best defense in the league. We'll do it one pot, one place, one pod, that is the Blue Horseshoe pod. So enjoy the rest of your week. We'll talk to you on Thursday right here on the Blue Horseshoe podcast.